So uh, thank you for attending today's lunch hour Wednesday webinar. We're talking about winter biking, the good, the bad, and the Zwift. And uh, generally, this is our run of show today. We want to show folks that you can have fun and you can be safe all year long. In fact, there's a lot of interesting studies that show that the winter itself isn't what deters people from riding. It's usually the infrastructure and the care for the infrastructure that we have available to us. So we'll talk a little bit about that, specifically like routes and talking to your municipality. If you're not riding at all, let's say like you're really just not a winter rider, you don't want to be cold, whatever it is, there are some good tips as far as getting your equipment put away for the winter so that when you do pull it out come next spring, it's good to go and you don't pull out like a rusty piece of iron. And finally, what about riding indoors? Some people feel like this is like the anti-bike. A lot of people love it though. It can be great for training, it can be fun. What's it all about? So we'll talk about that. And it's very sweaty. So to kick it off, um, let's talk about being safe on a bike. I'm gonna cut the, uh, the sharing the screen and we're just gonna talk to you about some things that we do. My name is Eric De Silva. And I'm here with my colleague, Dan Bassett. Hi, everyone. And the two of us are both working for the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, and we both help manage the education program statewide, teaching folks how to ride safely and how to have a good time and a good experience on their bicycles or whether they're walking. And that all ties in with active transportation. How do you use buses, trains, and other public transit in conjunction with walking, in conjunction with biking to get around. And we really want you to be able to do this year round. It's something that we enjoy doing. Um, and it's something that I feel like all of you could enjoy doing as well with maybe just thinking about like how to approach it. And so you can be, we can call this, how do you be a pro winter biker? Um, so I'm gonna go close my door because I have a crazy five-year-old outside and I'll let Dan take it for one moment. Well, everyone, thank you for coming to our webinar. Uh, super excited to talk to you all about um, winter biking. Um, you know, one of the things we always want to talk about here is, you know, winter in Maine, in Maine is not for the faint of heart sometimes. Um, but that shouldn't stop you from getting on riding your bike. But uh, what I want to say is that a lot of times, don't feel like you need to be get out every day and have, and have to ride super hard to be a true winter biker, get out when you can, and don't feel <clears throat> that we do hard on yourself and not getting out. We're just trying to give you some pointers here today that will just make you more comfortable and more confident when you do get out outside in this kind of weather. And the more of us that get out, it's very much strength in numbers. Do you see someone else get out? And then a driver is going to see two or three people, um, and then they're going to think, well, maybe I could do that too. So really, it's just showing support for one another and whatever capacity that looks like, whether it's going 25 miles on a zero degree day, or just like riding to the local corner shop when instead of taking the car or, or walking really, you know, so we're talking about walking and biking, but specifically this, this webinar is about bicycling. Um, and one of the other points we have in our notes here is, is about fear, especially the news. And I'm sure you remember like things like snow apocalypse, you know, like be, be scared, like how can we sensationalize the weather, which is very normal to have here in Maine in the winter. Um, and it kind of creates a scare tactic. So don't let that get in the way. It's really fun to ride in a blizzard, actually. Um, it can be very warm to ride in, the, in cold weather. It's just about how you prepare yourself and making sure that you're putting yourself in a safe place. So let's talk about route selection because I think putting yourself in a safe place is probably one of the most fundamental things you need to think about when you're going out in the winter. And what you choose to do in the summer is gonna likely be very different in the winter. Your favorite summer route, uh, whether it's for recreation or commuting to work or the grocery store, might have to change in winter conditions. So this morning, it, it, snow, it snowed up here in, in Orno and the roads are plowed, but they're plowed in a certain priority way. The route I normally might wanna take isn't gonna be the one that's gonna be plowed first. 
So you might wanna just give yourself extra time if you're gonna head out, be willing to do some exploring and backtracking if the route doesn't feel good to you. But what you really wanna look for is a route that's, that's either, for me, I look for a route that's not been cleared at all. If it's just a little bit of snow and there's not been a lot of traffic, it can work really well. Um, or look for a route that's really been cleaned well and not um, not leaving like slush tracks. I think I've heard some people call them like uh, dirsh, like dirt mixed with slush, dirsh. And it really makes it difficult. You get the slush, ice, junk, sand all mixed together. That's probably one of the most difficult things to ride through. So look at your route, think about it. Um, and be willing to adjust. The other thing that can be really nasty is a high speed road with a good shoulder might be fine in a dry condition, but once you get that little bit of like salt and water on the road and the spray that comes off of passing vehicles can really just feel unpleasant on your body. It covers the glasses in this like weird sheen that's hard to clean off. So you might want to find routes that would take longer to get to your office if that's where you're going, but allow you to be a little bit more comfortable and, and not have that, that stuff going all over you. Um, well, Dan, you are... So one thing you as well too is, um, you know, sometimes if you ride in the summer, you notice roads that might have some drainage issues. Those can be exacerbated even more in the winter. It also can be spots where water if it's settled during the night, freeze, you get a black ice, in the morning. So those are the things to consider as well. So you know, if your usual route, it's usually a very wet one if it rains, you might want to think of a different ride. Yeah. One thing that you can do too is, is if you are you continuously frustrated, oh my gosh, the sidewalks aren't cleared or they are cleared, but then all the snow gets dumped onto them afterwards and now they're now they're blocked again or the road shoulders are never cleaned off in my town or city. Reach out to your municipal leaders, the, the people that, that run your town and city and let them know that this is an important thing for, for you and for other people as well. They really respond well, I, in my experience and, and from what I've heard from others, reaching out to these people and letting them know that you need a, a safe route, even in winter conditions can make a meaningful impression on them and you can actually encourage public works to take action and clear that route. And the other thing, sort of um, uh, sharing the community spokes network, which is part of the Bicycle Coalition of Maine. If you're interested in knowing more about connecting with your municipal leaders and how to do that, and like, what, what's the process? How do I actually uh, make an effect on the places I live and, and travel in, then, consider becoming a community spoke. It's a free program. Uh, you can go on to bikemain.org, click on the advocacy tab and learn more to, more about the community, community spoke program. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool program. You can really take it a lot of places or you can just take it a, a gentle place. It's up to you what you wanna do. So let's talk about uh, dressing um, and what, what does that mean? Because I think it's really easy to open up a magazine, especially this time of year, or go into a bike shop and be like, whoa, you know, like I could look like Tron in all this stuff and like be super high tech and maybe slip right through the weather and the snowflakes won't even touch me. Or I could just like go out wearing my jeans. And can I do either one of those, Dan? You can do both of them. You could spend no money or you could spend thousands of dollars. It's your choice. Well, I want to spend a thousand dollars for sure. <laughs> So if I go out and I buy the highest tech stuff, what am I getting that I, I wouldn't get with a normal set of clothing? Really gonna look for is you know, fit, more cycling specific fit, a big part of it. Lighter weight, maybe more breathable fabrics. But honestly, a lot of it is you know similar to the stuff you'd buy, you would have normally if it's kind of going too. You know? So um, you know, what you're really getting is more cycling specific stuff that might perform better but you know if you're not looking for performance is it really worth it it's up to you so let's let's start with the head and go down to the toes um helmets i mean we always talk about helmets right it's like they're like indoctrinated into our culture you should wear a helmet all the time um i think generally speaking like i like to wear a helmet 
as a just in case. So wear a helmet. I have found that sometimes like my favorite summer helmet doesn't always fit over the really warm hat or the hood I want to wear. So something to keep in mind, like if your helmet fits really snugly, if you are a large head, but you're just fitting into a medium helmet, you might need a larger helmet to accommodate a, like a beanie or a wearing a hood up underneath of there. I really like to, I really like hoods. I don't have many like uh, shirts with hoods, but ho hoods work really well under a bike helmet. They just like kind of like, they don't add a lot of bulk and they just kind of keep everything nice and warm. But my second favorite thing is actually, I'll have two buffs. I'll have a buff around like my, my neck and then I'll have a second buff like on top of my head. And they're both really thin. They're both really easy to pack into a pocket, throw on and off. And it kind of keeps my head uh, either really warm and I'm easy to, easily able to moderate that temperature so I don't get too hot. I have some like cycling specific like neoprene hats. Those are good when it's really cold. Otherwise I can find them to be a little too warm. What do you do, Dan, on your head? Uh, I actually, I have a couple of those neoprene hats. Uh, I feel like my head gets cold pretty quickly. Um, one thing I also like to use is a, essentially was a helmet liner for skiing. Similar thing, it's got a thinner, lighter top, but it does have a felt around the bottom to cover your ears and your forehead and stuff like that. So it's bulky where it needs to be without getting interfering with your helmet. So these are quite nice and you can kind of get them at any kind of like outdoors or, you know, discount ski shop or something. Cool. So we have similar ideas. All right. So now we're on to our core. If I'm going out for like a ride and I know I'm going to get sweaty, um, it's going to be a longer ride or harder ride. I'm really going to avoid wearing cotton. Um, you've probably heard it before, right? Whether you're skiing, snowshoeing or biking, like a material that, that absorbs and doesn't lose the moisture like cotton is, is not a good thing to have against your skin. So I'll wear, I try to wear wool or some sort of synthetic or a blend of something and, and layers. I'm, the easiest thing to do is wear layers. If I only have a shirt and a giant parka, it's really hard for me to like moderate the heat that my body starts generating. I'm either a little too cold or way too hot. So I like to wear, I like to wear multiple layers. Not on that, I think one thing people are always surprised by when they ride is how quickly they warm up when they ride the cold. You know, it can be a matter of minutes and you're operating up in temperature. So. You know, that's when the joys of layering there is that you can quickly shed layers as needed and really kind of adapt your, you know, what you're wearing to your actual body temperature. The great thing about this is we're all living in New England. We all have clothing that works for this stuff already. So I encourage you to don't buy anything right off the bat. Like just wear what you have. And if I am riding somewhere, even if it's even if it's a 10 mile ride and I could get sweaty. I can also actively slow down so I don't get sweaty. I can wear normal clothing. I'll wear like what I'm wearing right now, button down shirt, just like a down jacket on top or a windbreaker. And you know, it's, it's not impossible to wear normal clothing. You can go a lot of places wearing normal clothing and just kind of keep an eye on your, your temperature so you don't get kind of like, you know, sticky. Um, all right, so now we're down to our pants. Um, I, I guess on the same token, like I'll go riding like, in pants like what you're wearing right now, Dan, just a pair of jeans sometimes works fine. I say that, you know, if it's a really cool day, some just thermal underwear underneath, like we probably all have living in New England, it works wonders this time. You want to say more flexible, there's always something like running pants or some kind of windbreak pant over thermals it will keep you pretty dang toast. Yeah, I have a pair of windbreaker pants that work really well, and they're actually made for cycling. The one nice thing about pants that are made for cycling is that they're usually pretty well tapered around the ankle. So you don't have any loose cuff that's gonna get caught up in the chain or the moving parts of the bike. But if you don't have something like that, I would say just get a piece of Velcro. Uh, they make a, some nice Velcro straps, use rubber band, just get that loose cuff so it's not gonna get caught in the bike or get rubbing on the rear tire and get dirty or wet from, from a wet road. Um, all right, so feet. I think feet for me is probably the one of the biggest things. Well, and we haven't talked about hands yet, but feet for me is one of the biggest things I change. If I, a lot, probably half the time in the summer, I'm using clipless shoes. So 
I have a cleat on the bottom of a specific shoe that clicks into the pedal. And that works for me um, down to about, you know, mid thirties. And once I'm below like 35 degrees, it's really hard for me to keep my foot warm, even with like a special like shoe warmer. So what I often do, and it makes it easier also, so you don't have to worry about frozen ice or slush getting into the mechanism of the pedal, is I just take my clipless pedals off and put a pair of flat pedals on, like a BMX pedal or a beach cruiser pedal. And so it's a flat, any shoe works on it. And in this case, I'll wear, I'll wear a boot, a boot that fits nice and loose on my toe area. So I can wiggle my toes, keep them warm. I can put additional socks on and keep my feet warm. Um, it's really easy to get off and just walk if it gets too slippery or the snow gets too deep in one section. And if I'm commuting, it's really easy because when I get to my destination, I don't have to change my footwear. I'm not wearing like a, a cloppy cleat made for cycling only. And so Dan's got something in his hand, looks like a shoe cover. So I like to wear his clipless pedals year round pretty much. Um, so one thing I like to use is a boot cover. These are kind of great. This one's made of neoprene, like a little close we can see. Um, the thing about it, it, it's pretty water resistant. Um, if it gets wet, it's one of my biggest concerns when I'm riding in the winter is getting my feet wet. Um, but since it's neoprene, it actually retains heat really well. It actually works a lot like a wet seat for your feet. So this is one of the nice things too. You can also get other kinds of foot covers that you know, emphasize blocking the wind, which is really helpful. Um, but one of my big things is when we're gonna ride cycling shoes, which you know, tend to have a pretty you know, strong fit to them and a strong outer side, is that I'm gonna be putting wool socks on to warm my feet. I need to consider how much more room that's gonna take up. And if that makes my toe box and my other parts foot just a little more cramped. One thing that really make your feet cold is when they get cramped and they can't move around. So a good cycling shoe in my mind for the winter is something that has a nice big wide toe box or at least just kind of keep a wider shoe. Um, it just allows you know, more blood to flow while having a bigger sock. Let's talk about hands. So hands get cold, but again, we live in New England. Everyone's got a pair of mittens or gloves. It's pretty easy to figure out what to do with our hands to keep them warm. Um, it's really easy to wear big mittens if your shifters on the bike aren't dependent upon like a little click with your index, then it can get kind of clumsy feeling. Um, so Dan looks like you have a pair of lobster gloves. I do. So these are one of my few indulgences I like, good gloves. So this is a lobster glove. This is great. I like to go fat biking. So, you know, mountain bike setup. I can have my thumb free to wrap around the handlebar one finger to cover the brakes and to manipulate the shift if I need to. And then the rest of my fingers, which you just pull into the bar, are, you know, maintained in one uh, little department. It's a super warm glove. You know, um, this is a pretty common style to see. I'm sure I've seen these in like cross country ski catalogs as well. So. Plus you can always do like, you know, live long and prosper. Is that with the thumb out or not? Yeah, no, no, I, don't I don't remember. Anyway. The other cool thing that I found is I, I often wear mittens. I try to keep my, my uh, I, I use a bike that I can just shift easily with. But yeah, Ethan, you're saying bar mitts. So yes. this is a bar mitt and it's uh this is a bar mitt brand, but this is a pogey. And pogies are sold in ATV stores and snowmobile shops. They're, they're good for motorcycles. And lo and behold, they're good for bicycles. So this is how this works. Uh, this is like a piece of neoprene. Mm -hmm. And what you would do is you would take your handlebar, and this is just something I grabbed out of my garage, but you'd slide this right over the entire brake and shifter. It's, they make different ones that work for drop bars, on, like on a road bike. This one's made for a flat bar, like a mountain bike style. I'm not gonna do it right now, but you'd zip up the entire bottom here. And then once this is attached to your handlebar, it's, it's on there with uh, some zippers and some Velcro. You can just take your whole hand with just a thin glove, sometimes no glove, depending on the temperature outside, and slide it right in. And now I have the ability to pull the brake lever and shift all within the protective layer of this, this pogi, this, this neoprene sheath. Um, so these are really awesome. Uh, they let you ride in what, if you, have, if you struggle with, with 
circulation in your extremities, especially your fingers, these are like a, you know, a game changer. I don't like to use that cliche, but um, they're just making your winter riding so much more pleasant. So check it out. These are, you know, online, you can make them. There's some DIY projects that you can probably find on YouTube. Um, they're in the bike shops and they come in lots of different, different types of, of uh, insulation levels and obviously expense, but worth checking out. All right, well, let's talk about technique now. So technique, meaning how do we ride our bike and how do we adjust appropriately so that we're not crashing and really hurting ourselves. And so one of the biggest things to just consider here is when it gets slippery, when the traction is less, just expect to go slower. Slower movements, slower turns, slower accelerations, slower decelerations especially. And what I like to do actually is, I do this in the car sometimes too, but if I'm in an area where I know I can do like a little self brake check, I'll drive my bike and just kind of grab my back brake a little bit harder than I normally would to kind of test what kind of traction is actually on the road surface. And then it gives me an idea of what's going on. So I'm not gonna, so I can anticipate a little bit better, have a better um, expectations for what the bike is gonna be able to do and what the road is gonna be able to hold me onto or the trail. So, um, echo that, Eric, just slowing everything down. Yeah, give yourself more time. If you're used to like really leaning that bike over and going around turns, be prepared to slow down before the turn. Don't lean nearly as much and keep your bike more upright. It does take, I find, some experience building to really start to be able to read the condition of the surface in front of you. Is it ice? Is it slush? Is it packed snow? Packed snow is great. Ice can be really deceptive. And if you're upright on the bike, you're less likely to fall on ice. If you're leaning over or trying to accelerate or decelerate on ice, you're gonna slip. And um, it really stinks to hit ice and slip. So try to like uh, give yourself extra time and be, um, be uh, prepared for these things by just by, by riding more conservatively. Someone just brought up uh, studded tires and that's, that's actually the next section that we're gonna talk about, which is bike setup. And so let's go back to one step before we talk about studded tires. Is, it, is that whatever you have right now is a great place to start because you're gonna figure out what you need. Uh, there are some folks out there that ride year round with no studs on their bike. There are some folks that ride with studded tires on the front and back. There are some people that ride with just a studded tire on the front only. And so you might not need any equipment and you might be able to figure it out without it. So really what, we're, what we want to encourage folks to do is don't go spend money because this is not something that need, this, this, you don't have to buy into winter riding. You can try it out and see what you need afterwards. But I would actually, before studded tires, I feel like the best thing to have on a bike is actually fenders. Yes. Um, fenders, like we, Maine is not the idyllic winter wonderland year, year through the, the, the winter season. We get a lot of wet weather and slushy weather, and you don't need studs in those conditions, but getting the spray off the road and all that junk onto your body and onto the bike is really damaging to the bike especially. And so a pair of fenders can make a, a really big difference. And the more coverage the fenders offer, and by that I mean the closer to the ground they go and the more they wrap around the front of the wheel, the better, because it's gonna limit the amount of stuff coming off the road. And some of that stuff is salt, and salt will really corrode the bike. Doesn't matter what kind of bike you have, what it's made out of, the drivetrain is made of steel and steel corrodes. So fenders is probably the number one thing I would recommend. And number two is studded tires on my list. What about you, Dan? Yeah, fenders, fenders, fenders. Uh, sadly, my bike can't support full fenders, but there are other options. You have ones that just kind of hang off your seat like this. 
that will protect at least the rider, the upper part of the rider. And we get one right here too, um, which is our BCM branded one. Um, that at least keeps some of the spray out of your face. You know, one of the big advantages to do uh, uh, full fenders is that they protect your feet. You don't get that spray up to your feet. They'll stay much drier, much longer. Some do used to live in a very wet place in the winter. Uh, fenders were an absolute necessity and they changed the rock. So. Yeah, so let me show you, I'll show you my setup. Uh, Dan's got his bike in the background there, which is a, a pretty nice bike. It's not the kind of bike that I would want to personally ride in really junky road conditions. Uh, in other words, a lot of salt. Um, but we will talk about maintenance in just a moment. But this is the bike I like to ride when I don't have to worry too much. Uh -oh. When I don't have to worry too much about getting home and immediately washing everything. So this is just an old... Hey, Eric, we uh, lost your voice. Can you hear me now? Hear you now. Okay, thank you, Dan. So it's just a cheap bike. I call it, you know, call, call, call it a junker, if you will. But um, it's got studded tires, number one. And so there's little studs on these tires all the way around. It's got the big long fenders that start near the ground and go all the way up and around the front wheel. Same on the back. And, but one of the biggest things on this bike is check out that drivetrain and how simple it is. It's just a couple gears. There's no expensive components there. I know this bike is gonna get exposed to salt. I know it's gonna be hard to keep in really good condition. And so it's just a really simple drivetrain, a couple like thumb shifters up here that I just grabbed literally out of like a junk pile at the take and leave at the local public landfill. Um, and this bike is something that I can ride and I don't have to worry too much about. Um, if it lasts me a couple of years, I'll be really happy. Um, but eventually I expect the frame to probably burn out and it's gonna have a, a hole in it. The other thing I've done with this bike is there's a product called fluid film. Uh, wool wax is another one. You can buy them at like the auto parts store. And I actually take a can of fluid film, it comes in like an aerosol, like rattle can. And I spray it on all the parts of this frame that are gonna get exposed to salt. I spray the inside of the frame too. I wanna, obviously I don't wanna like junk the bike as quickly as I can. I wanna keep it running well and as long as I can. But that stuff really creates this like, uh, this film on top of all the, the exposed pieces of metal on the bike and prevents that oxidation from occurring uh, with salt. Did you wanna add anything, Dan? I always also add to you, if you don't have some of the tires, really easy fixes, it's just lowering your air pressure in your tire. You, know, you could probably drop it 20% and be you know, totally fine. You'll have increased protection, but also shouldn't really run the risk of getting a pinch flat. So another option is just, you know, that will just increase your contact patch with the ground, get more, more grip. Here's another example of a studded tire. This is a studded fat bike tire. Um, it's a lot different than the one on the bike I just showed you because this is a four and a half inch wide tire. Both this tire and the one on my winter bike are studded at the factory. This is the way they come. This one has got like 250 studs in the entire tire and that's a lot of studs. But I've also studded tires myself. I've had friends stud their tires their self. Um, the easiest way to do that, and it doesn't work the best, but it's, you can take some really short metal screws and just drill them right through the casing of the tire and then pad the inside so you don't pop the tube. But you can also buy things, they're called grip studs, and there's some off-brand off -brand devices as well. But a grip stud is a little screw that is actually designed to screw in from the outside of the tire into the lug, and, and those can work uh, pretty well also. And you, you don't need 240 of them in your, in your wheel, in your tire. Um, even just putting like 40 of them can make a big difference. Um, yeah, the product is called fluid film. There's a que question in here. So fluid film uh, comes in a rattle can. Um, it's like a white can with a red top. You'll find it at like 
O'Reilly's or Advanced Auto Parts, Napa. Um, how does salt affect an aluminum frame? Um, salt will also oxidize an aluminum frame the same way. And the nice thing about an aluminum, at least, is aluminum tends to self-oxidize and create its own protective barrier, but that can sort of be smashed through repetitively with a lot of salt exposure. So you still want to be a little careful. Uh, we're going to talk about maintenance in a moment, but you can also, uh, fluid film, th there's been a bike brand around for a long time. I don't remember what it's called, but uh, for, for years now, decades, one of the best practices for any steel frame in any environment is when you buy a steel frame, the outside is painted, but the inside is often not coated with any protective layer. And so you would take something like fluid film and you'd spray it inside all the tubes a lot of times there's little weep holes on the frame where water can come out or during manufacturing where the air pressure can equil equilibrate. So you can stick the straw from the fluid film can right into those weep holes and spray some uh, protective coating in there. Um, it's easy to do when the bike is unbuilt, just the frame, because you can kind of roll the bike frame around and get the fluid film to really evenly coat the inside very well. Um, so that's, that's a great thing to do. Do you think it's a mistake to winter ride an e-bike in Maine with all the salt? And what are suggestions for winter tire? Let's talk about the tire first. So if you're riding a full slick in the summer on a road bike or a commuter bike, that might not be the best tire in the winter. You might want something with a couple studs on it. Um, width can also be an, an advantage depending on the snow conditions. Sometimes I find that a narrow tire is able to kind of cut through the slush and reach that solid surface underneath. But if you're riding on packed snow and cutting through creates like a, a trench that slows you down, then a wider tire, or like what Dan said, lowering that tire pressure can be really helpful. So those are good things to think about for a winter tire. And then the other thing obviously is looking for a, a studded tire. If you go into a bike shop right now, um, you, um, you know, I think maybe $60, $50 could probably get you a, a inexpensive studded tire that would fit most road bikes, hybrid bikes, commuter bike type frames. A fat bike studded tire is a lot more expensive, but that's that's a separate thing. We're going to talk about fat bikes specifically at a later webinar. One thing I would add to the tires as well is, uh, you know, if you go to a bike shop and ask for a particular tire that's good at clearing mud, it's probably going to be a good tire to clear snow as well. A tighter packed tread pattern but actually hold on to more snow if you know just kind of conditions where they might cling. Something that you know clears uh, mud or debris a bit faster is probably a better choice. Yeah. If if you if you want to do some experimenting or think about your own experiences, look at the lugs on the bottom of your shoes. Uh, like if I go outside wearing Crocs, I'm gonna die if I go running on slippery terrain. But if I have a nice pair of winter boots, the lugs are nicely spaced. Sometimes they're deeper. They shed snow really well. That's what Dan's talking about. All right, so maintenance. Um, and this kind of addresses the question regarding e-bikes. Uh, the biggest thing with maintenance really is keeping the bike clean of salt and keeping it lubed so that you keep a protective layer over stuff. Whether you're using fluid film on the bare parts of the frame or chain lube, on the moving parts of the drivetrain. Those are really important. So what I do when I get home from a ride is um, the easiest thing to do, if it's not too messy, is I'll get a couple bike bottles, general bike bottle, I'll go inside, fill it with hot tap water, go outside and just squirt down the drivetrain and, and the area where the brakes are, anywhere that slush and salt got coated on, I'll just rinse it off using a warm bottle of, of uh, a warm, water bottle. Um, the next best thing would be like, if you have access to a hose, I sometimes run a hose from our utility sink. So I have a hot tap on, hose coming out of the utility sink, spigot going outside and I'll spray the bike down with hot water. And that's if it's really junky or if I'm riding like a bike, like what Dan has, I really want to get it super, super clean. A water bottle with hot water isn't going to cut it. I'm going to need a lot more volume of water to get it clean enough. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge part. You know, one thing I say too is, you know, spray bottles are great, just normal, like some of these. You can just put some soapy water in there, some warm soapy water, that'll take care of it as well. 
Um, really the key thing, especially if your bike gets wet in this type of snow, it gets wet after a snowstorm, the salt in the road, you just gotta get that stuff off your bike as soon as you can, because that will corrode a bike quickly. Um, chains will rust out fast, much like it happens to a car. Um, so yeah, so in my mind, the really important thing is to focus on that would be cleaning your drivetrain, checking where your bearings might be that might be exposed to. So things like your bottom bracket, make sure that gets kind of cleaned out as best you can, at least around the, out, around the outside. Um, then your wheels, especially checking things like your disc brakes, getting that stuff off your disc brakes as best you can. So. And I found that it's the days like right now where it's right around freezing and the roads are slushy and messy. That's, those are the most difficult conditions. If it's really, really cold outside, you might get home from a bike ride or a commute. You might not have to do anything. Just put your bike away and it's fine because it's still clean. Um, but it's those like those middle ground days where it can really be a mess. It's really, it's the wetness is the thing to be concerned. Yeah, I like Ethan's recommendation here of a garden spray or hand pump. Yes. That's that's great if you don't have the the ability to run a, a warm water hose out from inside your house. The Next reason season. we focus on warm water too is just because it's a lot kinder on your hands. Yeah, that and if you have frozen chunks of everything stuck to your bike, cold water takes a long time. You're gonna use a lot of water to get it off. Warm water just like it just pops off. The bike looks so clean afterwards. So the next thing you got to do is dry your bike. Um, if you are fortunate enough to have a totally righteous basement, like what Dan is in, where you can roll your bike in and it can dry. I mean, that's awesome. I do not have a basement. So I try to like put my bike in a place where it can get some sunlight. And then I pull it into the house and let it sit in like the pantry or the mudroom. Um, it's, it's, you need to get the bike dry if you get it wet. Otherwise, that water gets into places. It makes it really difficult to shift, to break. The chain can freeze just with water, not corrosion. It can be really hard for the bike to function properly. So dry it properly. And then as soon as it's dry, especially the chain, get some chain lube on there. And um, that's going to protect the chain from, from corrosion and keep it working well the next time you go out. These are things you want to do before you put the bike away for, for good. Um, which is really the next section here. If you're not going to ride at all, what are you going to do with your bike? Um, so follow all the steps we just talked about. Wash your bike really well, dry it really well, and lube all the parts that need lubing. So definitely the chain, but take a look at other things too. If you notice a little bit of corrosion on the pivot points of a derailleur or the brakes, if you have like a rim brakes or some other brake that uses hinges, not hydraulic, but a mechanical brake, uh, you can drop a little bit of lube on those points, but you want to get those those points that are designed to move. Make sure that they're well lubed so that when you pull it out in a few months, it's going to be good. Yeah, really a good thing to do is just kind of give it a really basic tune up in some ways, you know, just that way you can kind of cover all your parts that might be that might um, have some kind of corrosion going on. At least get your hands on, take a look, you know, um, you know with us. But if it just sits there, sometimes that corrosion will just build and build, build over time. Uh, one thing I also like to do, because I've had this issue with bikes before, I like to make sure there's nothing staying and hanging out with the frame. What you can do sometimes then is just take the seat post out of the bike, flip it upside down. I've had bikes do do where some bosses are that will hold on to water. If water sits in your frame over the winter, it's not going to be good for the frame. It's not going to be good for the moving parts, especially your bottom bracket. So that's going to be a big part to clean up. And the last thing is like find a good place to put it. And so <laughs> ideally it's a dry location. A basement like what Dan is in can be really good. If your basement's damp though, um, that, that would be a bad place because again, bikes corrode. Um, so get a, put it in a safe place, put it in a dry place and it should be ready to roll. You might just need a little bit of air in the tires when you pull it out in the spring. One thing I would add too is that if you can hang your bike, that's always a bit better than having it on the ground. Only because if you put it on the ground and the tires don't move for months and they go flat, you can flat spot your tires. That just leads to, you know, them being deformed and not functioning properly. Um, other weird other things to check out too. If we do that, you know, if a tubeless tire set up, you have sealant in there. Either, you know, add fresh sealant or 
try taking that out and putting a tube in there for now. Because I, as working a mechanic, kind of seen bikes come in that have uh, hardened sealant, like pools of it in the bottom of the tire. Now you have a like two ounce, like a two ounce weight in your tire that's going to totally throw off its balance. So, you know, little things like that to be aware about. You know, for the most part, just put the bike away in a good condition and get it back in a good condition. All right, well, are there any other questions before we move on to Zwift and other indoor training? If there are, throw them into the chat. We'll be happy to answer them. I hope we answered the one about riding an e-bike. Uh, I wouldn't treat the e-bike any differently per se. Obviously it has some parts on it that just like a chain, you'll wanna pay attention to and make sure to give it some special love. So all the electronic bits, depending on what, what? The thing I would add is just know if you have a charging port on your bike, Make sure that's covered, especially in back back conditions. If you get any kind of salt in there, that could really damage the charging port. So. Yeah, I think that's going to depend on what kind of e-bike you have. I've seen some e-bikes where things are really well sealed, and I've seen some where the mechanics of the the e-bike assembly are really exposed. So, if you have an exposed variety, I bet there's a bunch of cool hacks out there. You could probably take a plastic bag and put it around the battery, um, that kind of thing, just to give it some extra protection if it's not already inside the, the down tube of a bike or something similar. All right, well, let's talk about Zwift indoor training. Um, I think Zwift is probably the most popular option out there if you're connecting yourself to an online platform, but there are actually a whole handful of ones that, that work. Zwift is sort of the, you know, the, the Facebook, I guess, of online training. If you are interested in socializing and actually having people to virtually ride with, then Zwift is a good uh, is a good option. So I'm going to throw up a screen here so that you can kind of see some ideas of what we're talking about. All right, so I kind of did a little bit of, of searching online to give you an idea of like what it would cost to kind of get into this. And Dan actually has a setup that he's going to show us. But Zwift is, uh, is a paid service. So it's like Facebook. Um, what's it like, actually? It's like, a, oh, I don't know. I mean, it's like, I guess it's like Netflix, right? You pay for it every month. There's a monthly, there's a monthly charge. It's $15 a month. And just like Netflix, you need some sort of electronic screen in order to engage with it. The cool thing about Zwift is that uh, like Netflix, I don't even have Netflix. I'm not a representative. You can use a smartphone, you can use a tablet, you can use a laptop, you can use a desktop computer, um, anything with a screen that can connect to the internet and hold the Zwift app can work. And then, all, then what you need is an indoor trainer that can connect to your bike. And this on the left side of the screen is the cheapest setup that I could come up with. I went on to Facebook Marketplace. I looked for a, a normal trainer that a bicycle can connect to. This is a trainer that doesn't connect to any electronics at all. These trainers have been around for 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, you can ride one of these without having any screens. You can put a movie on, you can listen to an audio book. You can put it outside in the driveway during a snowstorm, not go anywhere, but enjoy the thrill of riding a bike on a trainer. Or, so for $10, you can get that trainer used online, Facebook, Craigslist, Marketplace, um, garage sale down the street, whoever. Um, and then for an additional $40, you can get a, a compatible sensor. And there's there's this one that I have here is made by Garmin. It's all anything it does is speed. And so it's gonna show you how fast you're going. It's not gonna show you some of the other things that Zwift is capable of measuring. But this is a starter package. So for 50 bucks plus the subscription fee to Zwift, you can get yourself started and engage. The other way of doing it is what Dan's got there. And I think Dan, you have a direct drive system. I do have a direct drive system, yeah. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take the screen off so you can show us that we can see yours a little bit better. So yours is a smart trainer and the bike connects directly into it. Yeah. Um, I, actually pull it back a little bit, Dan, so that we can see the bottom or, or point your screen down. There you go. Look at that. There it is. So there's no rear wheel. Why is that? So yeah, so essentially it's just connected directly to a flywheel um, and has a cassette and everything. Um, so it's kind of its own drivetrain. 
disconnected on here. I just you know, put my other wheel off the side for the year. And uh, yeah, the fun thing about this um, is that it does make the whole experience a bit more fun. You know, if you've used Zwift, it's essentially a video game you ride your bike. Um, it has different worlds you can ride in, you know, different people. Um, but the fun thing about it with this kind of setup is that you go, if you're going to climb a hill, this thing will automatically add a resistance. So it's like as you go pills, like it becomes hard, it becomes more realistic. Um, it can do all kinds of fun things too, like it can measure power and all that, but just makes the whole experience a bit more engaging. The best thing about it too is that you don't wear down your own, you wear your own drive train, train down less. So it's less, you know, less wear in your wheels, all that kind of stuff. But that's something you are concerned about. Um, they are pricey, um, but they do make riding on a trainer, which can be very boring at times, uh, much more enjoyable. So. <laughs> and I would say too that a kind of a nice thing about this type of trainer, where the rear wheel comes off, it's called direct drive, is that you could have a mountain bike or something that would normally have a really knobby tire and use something like this without having the knob. So if you had a normal mountain bike and an old style trainer, the trick would usually be that you'd have to take that rear tire off and put like a smooth slick tire on in order for it to interface with the, the roller mechanism well this kind of gets rid of that i think dan you've also told me that one of the things you actually enjoy about zwift and this goes back to the social aspect is that you can connect with friends from across the country or maybe even the world and you can yeah. sort of virtually ride together in uh this sort of video game platform and does it offer like an audio? Can you see each other's faces as well? Can you talk to one another like you were, like you could in a group ride? So you couldn't do that the way, so I have a standing group ride that happens uh, starting in January, I call my friends twice a week. Uh, we all live all across the country. Um, it's the only time we get to really ride together all year. Um, and yeah, it's a, uh, so you, we, you can heckle each other online or just sit past like uh, messages through like, uh, through the interface. A lot of times we just set up a phone call and just, you know, talk to each other like that. Um, so, yeah, so there is a big social aspect to it, too. You know, if you, I've been on there and you can go ride with, you know, Mark Cavendish or other famous riders. They'll do group rides. You can join in. And granted, yeah, you're not actually riding with them out in the world, but you at least have that kind of experience of, you know, riding with those people and see what it can be like. So. Can you crash in Zwift? No, you can't. But um, if we could, I would have held some kind of record for it. <laughs> Can you? Uh, yeah, I play Mario Kart with my kids, so I, I imagine you probably can't go off jumps or do any kind of freestyle tricks either. Uh, no, it, it's pretty road focused, but uh, hopefully someday there will be a, a freestyle aspect to it. Okay, I look forward to that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to share my screen again, and. Uh, we wanted to share with you some upcoming webinars that we're going to be doing. We're calling these webinars, but I really want them to be more, I don't know if webinar is the right word, but in any case, Happy New Year's on January 11th. This will be another lunch webinar. We're going to be talking to Georgina Terry. Uh, she, this is an amazing woman. She started frame building in the 70s. And she was a real entrepreneur in women's bicycle design, clothing, a true maverick in, in the sense of everything. So we're actually going to be hosting her, interviewing her. We'd love to have as many of you present to share, share in that experience and really just ask questions. Let's find out more about what inspired her and what she's learned after all these years. And what does she see the future of of Terry bikes and maybe women specific or just bicycling in general, general. Later that month, January 25th, another lunch webinar, we're gonna be doing a similar, maybe sister podcast to today. We're gonna to be talking about the total like recreational part of winter riding. And so bikes, snow, yeehaw, let's roll on fatties. Um, fat biking, uh, bike packing in the winter, uh, bike joring, which is where you have a dog pull you on a bike. There's a lot of cool things you can do. Uh, biking on frozen lakes. That's one of my favorite things to do. I mean, a little, I, a little fat biking and ice fishing sounds like a great time to me. Yeah. I'd like to see how you carry the auger on your fat bike. <laughs> Slowly. 
<laughs> you, you probably have a bike driven auger, don't you? I mean, we can make one. Okay, we'll do that. We, we, we digress. <laughs> February 8th, this is going to be an evening webinar, 7 8 p.m. We're talking to Claire Brown. This is uh, a Mainer. She lives in Cumberland County. She's a world champion cyclist, Team USA member, and Paralympian. So another amazing uh, story of a local Mainer doing great things on bikes. So we look forward to sharing those experiences with all of you. Um, and does anyone have any more questions before we, we let go? If you wanna check out upcoming events, go to our webpage, click on events and calendar. That's where you'll find those webinars and any of the other events we're doing. Remember to check out the community spokes. It's under the advocacy tab. Thanks for joining Dan and I, and I hope you enjoy your winter. Reach out to either one of us if you have questions about winter riding, if you have questions about education, about encouraging other people to ride, we'd love to do what we can to support you in your community. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, and also please don't be afraid to go ride your bikes. You want to be a true winter warrior this year. But the warrior can be fun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>